thank you to Share Screen Africa for the for the opportunity. Um, this yeah, this series I think will, will will hopefully provide quite a lot of interesting content with such a broad range of, of topics. Um, it's good to see a few familiar names in the in the waiting room as well as participants. So welcome all. Thank you very much. Um, so for the next half hour, I'm just going to do a very brief introduction to, to carnivores, particularly in an African context. And um, because we've got such limited time, I'll go into a couple of apex predators and hopefully one or two things which might be of interest or new to some of you. A lot of you are already in conservation or the tourism world, so this might all be quite familiar. Um, we'll be talking about a number of species I mentioned, including this one, the spotted hyena. Um, a much maligned, misunderstood creature, uh, which I think deserves a lot more respect. Um, I look forward to, to talking about them in a bit. So the content of the talk introduction, thank you very much um, for Johan, your introduction, but just briefly, I'm Andreas Fox. I'm a professional safari guide, but in the last 15 years in the industry, I've done a, a number of different conservation roles and also um, trained a number of guides across Sub-Saharan Africa mainly on the Fagasa South African system. Um, so let's start with the carnivores. Okay, how do we define a carnivore? Um, if you know, have a think, I, I often like to ask the audience questions when I do presentations. Obviously, I can't get that immediate feedback, but I'll give you a second or two with a few questions to answer the question in your own mind. Um, if we We'll also look at why do we need wild carnivores in the world? What is their importance? Um, conservation being the theme across all of these presentations and the protection of wild spaces and ecosystems. What would the world look like if we were to eradicate wild carnivores? We'll look at some charismatic African examples, all terrestrial, and then finish with some themes on, on their conservation. So what is a carnivore? So the Latin definition um, derived from Carno, carne, and vorare, to devour, flesh devour, and refers to any meat-eating organism. Um, so when we talk about a carnivorous diet, uh, if we think of ourselves as humans and how we are omnivorous, or some people are vegetarian or, or vegan, we're going to be obviously referring to carnivore in its taxonomic sense. So the carnivora order. Um, the carnivora, carnivora order are all placental mammals, uh, that have evolved to specialize in eating flesh. Now, just a quick point, there are three mammal groups, um, placental being the most common, we are placental, obviously a female animal, female mammal that has a placenta with which it um, nourishes a developing fetus. The other two, marsupials, which have a pouch, and then also a monotreme, which is only found in Australasia, things like the ductile platypus, which lay eggs, very primitive mammals but the carnivores are all placental mammals. Predators is another term often used interchangeably because of the, the association with eating flesh. They're often higher, in, higher up in the food chain, higher in the trophic pyramid as secondary or tertiary consumers. However, something that I hope will be common in this theme and whenever you go into research, if you're I know there's a few university students here, if you're going to go into zoology, biology, et cetera, there will always be the odd ones out. Um, and that's something that should be exciting, whether you're a scientist or a guide like myself. So let's think of a odd one out when it comes to predators. This creature, albeit not African, is a bear. It is a carnivore. It's in the carnivore order, but the panda has specialized to feed on bamboo. So what makes the carnivora order um, unique? They all share certain common traits, with the odd one out, of course, but um, we're not going to go into the technical six, def uh, six common traits that, uh, that define carnivora, but one of the most common one is the dentition. Um, they've all evolved these conical shapes canines. Um, some of them are longer and sharper than others and used as tools with which to catch and kill or devour their prey. They are all missing a molar compared to other mammals. And then the carnassial shear is a common trait in most of them, which is these modified 
um, premolars and molars that have got sharper edges and when used against each other, they create a shearing scissor-like action. Um, anyone want to take a guess as to what this is a skull of? We're going to be talking about this later. This is a, a leopard. But however, as ever, there are exceptions. And if you look at this skull, this is of a very specialized carnivore. You can see the conical shaped canines, but then those premolars and the carnassial shear is no longer as relevant in this species because this has a very, very specific diet. Any guesses? This is an aardwolf. An aardwolf is a very specialized hyenidid. So it's in the hyenidae, hyenidae family. Um, some will classify it as a protellidae family, but it, is, it has evolved from the hyena branch shrunk into size to specialize in eating termites. So those little teeth are used to sort of crush up hundreds and thousands of termites rather than tearing flesh. We'll be talking about its bigger cousin, the spotted hyena later. So taxonomically, we're all part of the animal kingdom. Um, so the phylum, chordata, so this is all creatures that have a spinal cord, or a backbone, then under the mammal class, and this is where we share a trait or share a common history with these creatures, but then at the order level, carnivora, this is where they have specialized. Now, just for discussion's sake, some authors will classify suborders, the Feliformia and the Caniformia. This is basically de um, de separating the cat-like creatures and the dog-like creatures. The common ancestor of dogs and cats and all of their uh, relatives in the tree of life um, split away from each other, speciated around 60 million years ago. And why I wanna bring this up is because when we talk about certain creatures like hyenas, a lot of people assume that they are dog-like when actually they are much closer related to cats. And this is sort of a, a family tree to describe that. So the common ancestor of all of these carnivores, the dogs and the cats, the feliforms below and the caniforms above, splits away, as I say, around 60 million years ago. On the cat side of things, your felidae, so your lions, leopards, cheetahs, tigers, wildcat, domestic cat, things like your genets, your viverids, your herpestidae, these are your mongooses, and then here are the hyenids. So they split away from what has become genets and civets and your mongooses, and these are the fossas from Madagascar. You can see they're relatively recent compared to some other creatures, but on the cat side of the family tree. On the dog side of the family tree, Canadae, your wolves, your foxes, your domestic dogs, which have been bred from wolves, your ursidae, so these are your bears, remember the panda I mentioned earlier, then you've got sort of your seals, sea lions, walruses, skunks, red pandas, raccoons, which we don't get here in Africa, and then your mustelids. And these are otters, honey badgers, and the likes. So why are carnivores important? Um, let's consider what an ecosystem is first, because um, there are various definitions, um, but the one I, I, I prefer is one that refers to a self-sustaining system with energy inputs and outputs. And if you think of a very simple fam, uh, trophic pyramid or a food chain or food web, your secondary and tertiary consumers, your predators are always included as a means to keep the trophic levels below them in balance, self-sustaining. I've mentioned the word trophic and trophic cascades is a very good term that was, I believe, first coined in the 80s. And yeah. this really highlights the importance of predators, carnivores in an ecosystem. A uh, very famous example on which there are great documentaries and also TED Talks is the trophic cascade as happened in Yellowstone National Park in North America. Just to briefly summarize, Wolves, being the apex predator in that system, were completely eradicated by 1926. And the impact it had on the ecosystem was dramatic. The herbivores that they would prey upon, things like elk and deer, etc., were 
now suddenly able to flourish. There were no predators keeping their population in check. Not only did their numbers explode, but they also changed their behavior. They started grazing and browsing in areas that they would normally avoid because it was an ambush zone for wolves, for instance, particularly on the banks of rivers. What that did is it meant that the soils there were degraded as a result of overgrazing. Aspen trees were no longer able to propagate. The river caused a huge amount of bank erosion. And then the lack of that vegetation meant that songbirds and smaller mammals were no longer as common. And the simple reintroduction of wolves changed all of that. The wolves started bringing the population of herbivores down again. The vegetation around the riverbanks improved. That brought back smaller creatures. The river banks were no longer as eroded, and therefore the river slowed down and meandered. Beavers returned, and you could directly link the presence of the apex predator to the health of the river ecosystem in particular. This is a great example from North America. We can think of others from around the world. I just want to bring one in that impacts humans a bit more. And this is an example from India. I'm going to oversimplify this. But vultures, be it birds and not carnivores, but their role as uh, tertiary consumers in the ecosystem um, were virtually wiped out in India as a result of feeding on carcasses of cattle that had died but had lots of pesticides and um, various other chemicals used during their lifetime. Stuff they picked up from the soil and grass they eat plus what was sprayed on them. India has a significant Hindu population. For religious reasons, they don't consume beef. And so a lot of dead cows would be left out outside to, to sort of return to the ecosystem naturally. Now, the fact that vultures were no longer able to raise chicks because the impact of these chemicals reduced the strength of their eggshells. So a lot of chicks and eggs were dying in, in the nest. So the population of vultures crashed. The result of not having any vultures to scavenge off these cattle carcasses meant that that niche was then filled by feral dogs. Their population exploded. Feral dogs bring with them sometimes canine distemper and rabies. And the rabies that re re resulted in the human population can be directly linked back to that trophic cascade because of the lack of vultures. So we need to consider all the trophic levels in the health of an ecosystem, but sometimes the lack of a tertiary consumer or a predator carnivore can be significant. So mo moving on to a couple of apex African carnivores, um, we're going to talk about these three here, the spotted hyena, the African leopard and the African lion. Um, this is more just out of interest. Some of you um, are fully aware of these creatures, work with them every day. Others might never have seen them before, and I hope you do. And I hope that some of the interesting facts that I bring today will spur um, a greater appreciation for them. Panthera leo, the African lion. Uh, wanted to talk might recognize this pride of lions from um, Karangwe Game Reserve in South Africa. Um, they are obviously iconic around the world, king of the jungle, king of the beasts, are they really so though, and, um, and have been used in folklore across the globe. Famously, they are known as the only truly social cat, but is that the case? Fam they are able to hunt as a group, generally able to take down bigger prey. And we'll talk about their niche in an ecosystem shortly, but this is believed to be the only truly social cat. However, there are exceptions, such as these guys. This is a coalition of male cheetahs. These are actually two from a very famous coalition in the Maasai Mara that up until about a year ago numbered five in strength, which was hugely significant, especially as they were not all related. Cheetah males, will often leave their mother at independence if they've survived and become a coalition to help them hunt, to help them maintain territory, et cetera. Um, but occasionally, as with this case, you have unrelated males sticking together and forming a coalition. Females generally are more solitary, but there are examples out there. And I was recently sent one of one down in, in Southern Africa, a place called Samara, where you had two females, mother and daughter with separate cubs allo mothering. They were essentially taking care of each other's cubs. So there's always going to be interesting things thrown at you if you are researching these creatures. 
So what is the lion's niche? They're found, and we'll look at distribution maps later, um, across uh, sub-Saharan Africa. Historically, they were further north into Africa. There's a small population in India. They're basically found in most savanna ecosystems from semi-arid, nearly deserts, such as in the Kalahari and Namib, um, up into the savannas of East Africa, but are not found in the thickest of forests, such as in the Congo Basin or in the Sahara. And as we said, they are big predators able to hunt massive animals like buffalo, some even elephant, as a result of strength in numbers. And generally, as a result of their size and the strength in numbers, they are able to outcompete other predators who have then had to evolve behaviors or to sort of avoid them, such as this poor leopard. Um, generally, um, leopards will avoid lions by being more um, thicket-based, possibly uh, more arboreal in trees. And lions, as with a lot of carnivores, will eliminate competition when possible. A leopard will eliminate a smaller carnivore if it was to come across it. Unfortunately, in this case, this leopard um, didn't make it. And more often than not, the lions are just simply eliminating their competition. They are not necessarily going to feed on that carcass. But the tables often turn, and we'll talk about hyenas in a bit, but when strength in numbers is in their favor, spotted hyena clans can and will chase off lions. Sometimes they will kill them and eat them. And that balance and the relationship between them changes depending on which ecosystem you are in. This is an interesting photograph of a leopard that has preyed upon a lion cub. Um, and this will be in, uh, in a way of eliminating competition, but also leopards have one of the most varied carnivorous diets of, of any carnivore. And I'm confident that this leopard will have consumed that lion cub. Um, there's so much we can talk about, about any of these animals and we could do presentations on them specifically, but I just wanted to hone in to one or two key interesting facts, um, uh, particularly about uh, lion so reduction. Like all cats, they are induced ovulators. This means that even when a female is in estrus, she needs some sort of external stimuli to ovulate and be able to conceive. In the case of lions, it is the repeated mating over a five day period up to every 15 minutes that induces that ovulation. And she might only be able to conceive in the third, fourth or last day of that mating cycle. This lioness wants to mate with as many males as possible if she can. She wants to mate with the dom most dominant male in an ecosystem so that those genes are passed on to her cubs. She's also going to try and mate with as many different males as possible so as to potentially confuse them. Um, one of the biggest threats to young lions is infanticide from other males that are trying to get a female to come into heat so they can pass their own genetics on. So if that male lion has mated with this female, even though he might not be the father, it might potentially confuse him into thinking this female is familiar, those cubs could be mine, I'm not going to kill them. I want to quickly talk about sexual selection in lions as well. Um, I mentioned that female might be trying to mate with as many different males as possible. Um, and, sometimes, and she's gonna be looking for the most dominant genes. And an interesting experiment that was done in the Serengeti was to look at main density and main color and how that was perceived by lions. So these funny looking but life-size models were put out. And to summarize, females showed far more interest in these darker maned lions they would have likely, a darker male lion in, in, in the wild is likely to have potentially higher testosterone. The idea behind it being um, under more significant heat stress could potentially play a role that shows that it's got strong genetics. Um, so the females were interested in these guys and the males sort of ganged up on the lighter male lions, male lions, almost as if assuming they were weaker and not as testosterone rich and therefore easier to eliminate. The famous lions of the Serengeti Mara ecosystem, Kalahari, the Barbary lions that are now extinct, uh, the Cape lions, all famously have thick, dark manes. But there are populations out there where manes are not as significant, such as this lion, uh, possibly from the Savo ecosystem in eastern Kenya, where the heat and the thick bush environment with lots of conifera and acacia thorn trees 
potentially reduce the need or the ability to grow a significant mane. We can tell this is a male lion from the genitalia back here. So much more to talk about lions, but I hope you found all those things interesting. We move on to the spotted hyena, Krokuta Krokuta, um, one of my favorite creatures um, because it is fascinating in its social um, dynamics, but also very misunderstood. Um, hyenas, through various cultures, myths, films, some that won't be named, um, have painted them as slovenly, cowardly scavengers, but they are significantly good hunters and in some ecosystems will hunt far more than the lions in that ecosystem and it's the lions that do more of the scavenging off the hyenas than the other way around. This amazing photograph of an adult spotted hyena taking down a fully grown topi which will weigh nearly twice as much as it does um, just goes to show that they are extremely effective hunters and they are clan animals and given the chance they will take down even bigger prey um, by ganging up on them together. So they are not just cowardly scavengers. Their niche, they have the most powerful jaws of any terrestrial mammal in Africa. As you can see from this dentition, very formidable premolars. And this allows them to crunch bone and utilize more of a carcass than lions say. Um, we talked about them being hunters and they will also scavenge when given the opportunity. So their niche um, is, is quite broad and they are found in places that other mammals or other carnivals rather have been eliminated around human settlements um, and in slightly thicker or even more sparse environment than lions. One of the most interesting things about hyenas is their social dynamics and the fact that spotted hyenas are matriarchal. In fact, every adult female hyena, even the most lowly ranked female is higher in rank than the highest ranked male. The testosterone level is that the females are exposed to in the womb and through evolutionary process has meant that their genitalia has morphed to look phallic and very masculine. And for a long time, people used to assume that they were hermaphrodites because it was almost impossible to tell or they couldn't see any females. So they just assumed or what they thought would be females. Um, telling them apart in field can be quite a challenge. Um, these close up photographs, forgive me for the graphic nature of them, potentially can be useful for identifying the gender of, of a spotted hyena, but um, it's more often than not looking at adult behavior, who is submissive to who the slightly smaller male adult will be very obvious to spot around a den site because he will be having to be submissive to all of the females. Interestingly, a matriarch, her latest born daughter, the princess, will always be the second in line in that. Okay, I use the word always. There's never always and always. But um, there is, uh, so yeah, the second, the last born, the youngest female cub to a matriarch assumes that second in command position. And it's amazing to watch these tiny little cubs um, dictate social interactions and you see big adults sort of bow down and be respectful to that behavior. The African leopard, um, one of the most versatile carnivores found all the way across to Korea. Um, so different subspecies, of course, we're talking about the African one here, but they have the same general shape uh, patterns and behaviors. Their niche tends to see them able to exploit habitats that the other two predators that I've mentioned can't. So the deepest, thickest jungles of the Congo Basin, for instance, or in, in, in Southeast Asia, um, they will likely be the mammalian apex predator. But they are just as happy on the fringes of human populations. So this is a photograph of a leopard in Mumbai, India, where they're arguably at their densest of anywhere in the world. And they've been able to eke out a living by hunting feral pigs and domestic dogs, whilst avoiding the gaze and conflict of a significant human population. Just wanna quickly mention something on black panthers because this is something quite topical at the moment. There is a small population of melanistic leopards that is um, being photographed regularly now in Kenya. 
a black panther isn't a separate species. It is simply a big cat that has a genetic trait that means there is an overproduction of melanin, the dark pigment in the skin and fur. You can see in this photograph, you can still see the rosettes under certain lighting conditions. This is a young melanistic leopard. So a black panther is either a melanistic leopard or a melanistic jaguar, as has been recorded in Central and South America. I don't believe there are any records of melanistic tigers or, or lions for that matter. So just to, yeah, so let's get into the, the conservation and status of these animals. Unfortunately, like a lot of wildlife, um, their historical ranges are much bigger than what they, what they um, are able to exist in today. This is a leopard, as I mentioned, they are extremely successful and found all the way into uh, Southeast Asia. Um, and there are pockets of very rare subspecies, such as the Arabian leopard, which is believed to be extinct in the wild, although there are captive breeding projects to try and reintroduce them. Um, here in Africa, you can see the Congo Basin, there, historically, all this gray was where they would have been found, everywhere except the depths of the Sahara Desert, um, Atlas Mountains here, um, and other mountain ranges where they might still be found today. The lion, that small population of Asiatic lions in Gira National Park in India up here, but otherwise all of the Mediterranean, the historic Barbary lion, um, no longer alive today. So you can see the gap around the Sahara and Arabian deserts, and then here the thickest forests in the Congo Basin where we did see leopard. The current lion population is extremely fragmented, mainly across well-maintained um, protected areas. Um, contiguous ecosystems such as Nyasa into what the Sulu National Park and the Mozambican Tanzanian border, the Ruaha Basin, uh, here in Savo to Amboseli to the Mara and South Rift into the Sangeti and Gorogoro. Those are some of the most viable lion populations in East Africa, but there are some really isolated pockets um, which are under serious threat. Spotted hyena. Very similar distribution to lions, albeit not into the Mediterranean or Asia. The striped hyena is the one that takes over in those regions. The Sahara Desert and the forests of the Congo Basin are the only exceptions. The Cape in Southern Africa, where they were sort of wiped out um, in the last couple of centuries and basically run all the way through Sub-Saharan Africa. Otherwise, as I said, they're quite well adaptable into human environments as well. So why, why are these creatures under threat? Um, we can see from those maps sort of habitat fragmentation um, and, and islands of genetics. This is a photograph from Nairobi National Park, um, which is a, an incredible um, resource that still exists in the part of a capital city, the only one in the world. There's a population of give or take 40 lions in only 114 square kilometers. Historically, they would have been able to follow prey that migrated out of the park. Um, but now more and more roads, fences, um, and people are blocking those routes. So it will become an island and um, will need to be managed as so. The skin trade or the trade in lion bone, tiger bone, teeth um, for fashion, traditional medicines, um, practices across Africa when it comes to Sort of traditional medicine and, and witchcraft, witchcraft beliefs still are having a significant impact on a lot of these cat species. And one of the biggest thing, threats that's going to happen in the future, as is already happening, is human wildlife conflict, where communities who live and share their land with these predators are losing um, livelihoods and livestock. This Maasai community unfortunately lost significant amount of their sheep herd when a leopard jumped into the pen, uh, into the boma, was unable to escape and um, went on a killing spree as, as often predators do when they are enclosed in a space where their prey cannot escape. And as a result, um, and, and understandably, people are very upset and want to potentially retaliate. And that could be in the form of targeting an individual predator, or it could be the indiscriminate use of things like poison 
And unfortunately, poison is so indiscriminate that any carnivore or scavenger that consumes that, that carcass that's been laced with the poison will, will die. Um, as is this photograph of a lion and a white-backed vulture. Um, and think of every jackal, every hyena, every other innocent creature that would have tried to scavenge on that carcass. So these are all challenges um, when it comes to the conservation of these carnivores. But I personally have, have um, cause for optimism and hope because um, outside the core conservation space that is set aside in, in national parks in a lot of uh, a lot of these carnivore ranges, there is now more and more work being done on the periphery to ensure connectivity. And this is an example of uh, a big male leopard in a community conservancy in the northern Maasai Mara ecosystem, where the landowners, the Maasai landowners, lease their land to tourism partners, but still have the right to graze their cattle as they would traditionally. And the use of good animal husbandry techniques, having herders with the livestock during the day, predator-proof uh, fences at night, means that this kind of photograph exists. The leopard, you could argue, is looking at the human, and he probably is terrified of him, but he's also looking at this Thompson's gazelle that is fully aware of the leopard's presence. So a very, very short and simple um, summary of the potential conservation um, challenges, but also one of many, many potential projects out there trying to stem the destruction of these wild spaces and the carnivores. Um, I have no idea what I'm doing for time, but um, I would like to open the floor to any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Andreas. That was a very good slideshow. And before you stop share, I wonder if you could go back to your first photograph on your opening slide, because interestingly, it's one that I often use when yeah. I teach. Um, and I was I was chuffed to see it there. It's an incredible photo. It is an amazing photograph. And you can yeah. Quite a few slides there. Uh, okay. the, the hyena and the wild dogs. Yes. So for all of you students in the room, now, often when I teach with this photo, I cut out the right hand side at about the hyena's midriff and I asked students to tell me what is going on in this photo and I want you to think about that now but then think about how important it is with carnivores to know the whole story because I then show the full photo and now your analysis of what is going on is completely different. Mm -hmm. So what I want you to think about from Andrea's presentation today is how this portrays across the world of conservation from humans living, coexisting with wildlife and the wildlife coexisting with wildlife in its spaces. And remember, these are confined spaces. So you need to know the whole story before you make any judgment or assessment of what you think is happening. And I don't know, Andreas, if you want to expand on that a little bit with the conservation mindset there. Um, yeah, yeah. So, so as you say, the context of, of an image, um, the context of a, any story is, is so important and it's very important that we are able to, to try and find other perspectives on a situation. Um, in, in, in that human wildlife conflict scenario um, and the picture of, of sort of all those dead sheep in, in, a, in a boma, um, that will elicit extreme emotions and understandably so. Um, but we don't know that co the context of where that boma is, um, whether there's any conservation practice in that area, what is the cause for that predator to potentially target that, um, that particular individual's homestead. And there is no silver bullet. A uh, conservation in, in, in one region versus another, I mean, across national borders, completely different policies. If we look at, 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 at Kenya's um, very different conservation model to others where state owns the wildlife, there's no consumptive use of wildlife, there's no hunting, there's no ability to, to consume um, venison wild flesh versus other countries in Africa where that model is possible. So trying to incorporate the same conservation tools and projects across national borders with very different policies is not always possible. Um, 
and even within one country, uh, a, a landscape such as southern Kenya, where you have still traditional pastoralism as a, as a majority land use, is quite different to somewhere else where agriculture, farming, um, and the need for defined boundaries and fences. Uh, so the context of a system is, is, is very important to consider. Yeah, thank you very much, Andrea. So I, I encourage all of you students here or anyone who is in the audience to comment and ask any questions in the chat. Um, or if you put your hand up, we can unmute you and you can ask your question direct. So <clears throat> does anybody here have any, especially African Nazarene students who are the primary audience here? Um, if you can put up your hand or ask any questions in the chat. Um, while we wait for that, Andreas, a couple of questions from my side. Yeah. One would be sort of this human, obviously the survival of carnivores depends in my eyes on two things. That is the dominant human activity in the area mm. and the connectivity with other areas. So will we potentially see lions moving into forested areas? Because I did hear there were two lions who have been hanging out in Arabuko Sokoki forest for a while. Yeah. Um... So the exception to the rule thing I mentioned earlier, there will always be situations which will surprise us. And, and maybe the Zarabuko Sokoke lions moved in as a result of inability to find wild prey. And, there, and as those who don't know that ecosystem surrounding that forest is, is a lot of humanity and, and may be forced into some sort of safe space that's not necessarily their normal environment as a result of human persecution or the threat of human persecution. Um, and then also expose, exploring niches that need, are vacant. So there's cases of, um, if I can give an where lions and hyenas as the apex predators were almost eradicated from farmland due to conflict with, with the farmers who had livestock. But cheetahs somehow survived by staying under the radar and became nocturnal and behaved in a way that you'd expect a leopard would simply because they were able to as a result of not having those competitors there and also as a threat of persecution from, from humans. Um, so I think we will start to see creatures and carnivores or those particularly persecuted by, by humans moving into spaces that are not necessarily their traditional ones. Um, and I totally agree with you on, on connectivity and there's some really interesting work being done with, with collars um, able to track the movements of, of creatures, including a recent lion that was a trouble animal um, causing a lot of human wildlife conflict in central Kenya that was um, taken to Savo East National Park and left to his own devices. And this lion walked along the, the Mombasa Nairobi highway and railway line, crossed into a town known as Sultan Hamoud, lived there for a few days hunting donkeys, went down to Amboseli, found more lions, went west and ended up settling in the South Rift. So he would have covered hundreds and hundreds of kilometers in his journey, trying to find the space where he was safe and also to find food. Um, and that is a great example of potential genetic flow if it is allowed to happen. Wow, I wasn't aware of that lion, interesting. Uh, it's an Owasso lion's um, study animal, which hopefully they'll oh. be publishing a report on in time. Nice, and then um, I'm hoping that there will be other questions, but I have plenty lined up of my own. So another one is, is maybe you could talk a little bit about learnt behavior because you know these different behaviors that are passed down through families. And I'm thinking specifically of the fishing leopards um, mm -hmm. in Moremi. Uh, yeah, is it in Moremi or, and also there, you know, I was very lucky to work in Botswana in the Delta and we had a certain group of leopards that were all related who were, raiding white-backed vulture nests, which was incredible. Wow, yeah. Yeah, and um, so a lot, of, a lot of this behavior will be taught from mother to, to, to offspring. So I presume that both those examples, as the cubs were growing up, and with leopards, you'd expect a cub to be with their mother up to a year and a half in age, sometimes a bit longer. Um, and, and in their last couple of months before they go independent, they will actively be following in hunts. And so they will have seen this behavior from their mother and, and no doubt taken that forward. And um, we see the same um, across Africa with examples of tree climbing lions, 
which can in places like Queen Elizabeth National Park or certain parks in northern Tanzania, where they can all sort of be traced back to one group of females that did it and the cubs learned to climb the trees when they were part of those original prides. And then as those prides have grown and split across the habitat, it tends to be the descendants of that original pride that was seen doing it, doing the same. Um, it just from a, in a, in a guiding context, uh, some learned behavior that I've seen, which might be a little dubious is to see how hunting carnivores have used humans as a means to mm. hunt. So, um, that group of cheetahs, for instance, uh, that coalition of five males, world famous, very habituated, and in the peak season of July to August a few years ago, they would have you wouldn't have seen them without at least forty other vehicles in attendance, um, and which can be very disruptive to 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 hunting predation. But these cheetahs learned to adapt to it and. The way I found out sort of by accident was I was on a game drive in the Masai Mara, nowhere near the core territory of these five male cheetahs. And we came across them completely by accident. And I thought I'm the luckiest guide on the planet. I've got these cheetahs to myself. And um, they were stalking some wildebeest as they, they famously took down and they just started sleeping. And it wasn't until I decided to move and I started my engine that they got up and started hunting. So they're so used to the sound of engines and movement of cars that they seem to have learned to use it to their advantage. So they wanted to use the vehicle and the sound of the vehicle particularly to potentially mask their movements as they stalk these predators, uh, stalk their prey. Um, so that's learned behavior. Um, and I can imagine if, those, if that was a female cheetah with cubs, those cubs would start to do the same, but this was a mm. coalition of males. So that's not gonna be something that will be passed down, of course. Fantastic, thank you. Um, Dr. Mickey Mwamuya, I'm just going to ask you to unmute. Andreas, Mickey is one of the leaders of the Africa Nazarene group. And mm -hmm. Dr. Mickey, if I can ask you to unmute and come in here. Yes, Pauline. Yeah, uh, thank you, Andreas, for that interesting talk. Um, thank you, Mickey. Yeah. I see one of my students here, Ambrose. Um, I'm sure he's, uh, he's he must have some good, interesting comments here concerning the the, the Black Panther. Is this Ambrose Letubuai? Yes, I, yeah. I, I know him well. Yeah. <laughs> okay, well, Ambrose, we've got it on you to unmute you now. So I am just looking for you if you can. Um, oh, you're already unmuted. Yes, go ahead, Ambrose. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Andrea. Uh, I think uh, I really like the interesting thing about, like, uh, I think I and you have witnessed one of our female uh, leopard, like, use the engine to hunt. So, yes. yeah, the, 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 the leopards, uh, you know, the carnivores are start tendons of behavior to use the humans to, to hunt and the... Uh, I, I absolutely uh, agree with you. So thank you very much for that talk, Andy. Yeah, thank you. Good to hear from you, uh, Ambrose. I hope the, the Black Panthers are doing well up in Lakipia. Thank you. Aziza, I see you have a question. I'm asking you to unmute here. Okay, uh, I wanted to ask a question about the, the Krokuta Krokuta. Hello? Yeah, we can hear you. You just have to speak a bit louder. You're very quiet, but we can hear you clearly. Okay, I wanted to, to ask a, a question on uh, Krokuta Krokuta, the hyenas. Yeah. yeah I see that uh, Andres, he's talking a lot about the, the, the Krokuta Krokuta. Uh, what about the, the strict hyena? Do they, be, do they behave the same as, do they have the same behavior as the Krokuta Krokuta? Sorry, which which hyena are you referring to? I'm referring to the the reported hyena. There are two types of hyenas. We have the the crocuta, crocu, the the striped hyena and the striped oh, striped hyena. hyena. Yes, yes, oh, yes. I, yeah, spotted hyena. Because I'm seeing you are talking a lot about the 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 the, the spotted hyena. What yeah. about the striped hyena? Do they behave the same? Is the um, behavior the same? 
Thank you for the question. Um, no, they, they do not. Uh, so we, we, there's actually four hyenas across Africa. Your Krukuta Krukuta, your spotted, and then your striped hyenas, which are sort of Tanzania and northwards into Arabia and India. Your brown hyena, which takes the same niche, but in Southern Africa. And then we mentioned the odd wolf, which is a very specialized um, insectivore. So the striped hyena has a very different social structure. Actually, very little is known about them, but while they will live in communal dens, they do not hunt in the same way um, as Krukuta Krukuta in that they won't take down big prey. They generally are far more scavengers, although they have been recorded to hunt smaller antelope species, etc. But generally, much, much more secretive, um, much widely more widely distributed, but nowhere near as the numbers. So, for example, in, in the Greater Mara ecosystem, there are anywhere up to 2,000 spotted hyenas, um, 500 adult lions, give or take, whereas the striped hyenas generally are outcompeted there by those apex predators and will be found on the peripheries in the sort of forested margins, the rockier hills, and they tend to be more common in places like Savo and Lakipia and then northwards. Uh, so very different behavior, and they also do not have that same matriarchal structure that the spotted hyenas do. Aziza, does that answer your question, or do you want to add anything more to that? Yeah, thank you. And uh, I wanted to add something also, because if we check on the first photo, mm -hmm. you remember the first photo where we have the, the hyenas? Yeah. Yeah, the first photos I see the animals, the carnivores. It's like uh, it is a dry place. According to me, it is a dry place, and they don't have anything to feed on. So it's like the carnivores they are trying to feed you, feed on each other. Is that uh, true or no? Oh, this is referring to that first opening photograph of the African wild dog and the spotted hyena in conflict. Um, no, so, so I guess this is to your point, Holly, about what people see in that photograph. Um, so this isn't a, a case of predation on each other. Um, we can hypothesize that they have met around a potential kill site, say one of the species has killed something and the other is, 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 is potentially coming to scavenge, likely the hyena trying to scavenge off the wild dog. Um, and they will harass each other, potentially kill each other to eliminate competition. So this is the wild dogs ganging up on the spotted hyena who they want to either eliminate or get rid of, get it out of their way so that they can hunt in peace or finish their meal in peace. This isn't a, a case of them preying on each other. Thank you. Mickey, I've asked you to unmute. Go ahead. Yeah, thank you, Andreas. Um, perhaps I would want to also hear your comments on some of the interesting and predatory behavior that you've observed in the course of your, uh, your work. Was that an anti-predator behavior, did you say? Yes, yes, yes. Um, is there anything specific you would like me to, to focus on one particular predator and, their, and the creatures who've evaded them? Or are you talking about humans? Um, I think um, just a little comments um, uh, looking at uh, most the most common uh, prey predators within the savanna ecosystem. Okay. Um, all right, for fear of sort of going on a long tangent, but so we evolution um, is, is an arms race. You've got herbivores or let's say prey species that are always um, whether they're faster, fitter, stronger, better camouflage, there's all sorts of different um, evolutionary traits that have been uh, that have been adapted and prevent individuals from from being predated. And a common one is is uh, is safety numbers. So you'll find huge numbers of, of animals and often unrelated species grazing together, browsing together so they can physically be near each other. So should they have a predator in the area, they're more likely to detect it. Or if there was to be a successful hunt, there's the statistics of you being the individual taken down is, is, is reduced. Um, just one, one, one thing that immediately came to mind, you mentioned savannah ecosystems, is if we think of um, and the antelopes, and uh, something that was pointed out to me a few years ago, which I thought was quite interesting, um, is, is the prevalence of, of horns in, in female antelope species and which habitat they 
um, are found in. And generally, it's not a hard and fast rule. I'll talk about some exceptions in, in a moment. But generally, if an antelope or prey species exists in a more open grassland environment, then the females are likely to have horns, which would make sense because they want to be able to defend themselves or their babies against the predator. So if you think of all the gazelle species, if you think of eland, um, topi, wildebeest, these are all creatures that inhabit open grassland environments. However, when you start looking at more thicket and, and thicker bush and forest environments, a lot of the female antelopes don't have horns. Um, if you think of kudus, the greater kudu, the lesser kudu, the females don't have, have any horns. Impala is an interesting, very successful antelope species that is able to inhabit a whole range of habitats, um, but the females don't. There are always exceptions. So think of the mountain bongo living in one of the thickest environments possible, yet the females also have horns. The, the hypothesis as to why females might not have horns in thicker environments is to allow them to pass through this thick bush without the hindrance of these implements on their head. So I, I hope that's of interest in these different anti-predator evolutionary traits um, that have evolved. Um, Mickey, I hope that answered your question. And, and as we don't have any more questions, I have one more for you, yeah. Andreas. And um, yeah. I'm also, it's about asking the sorts of behaviors that perhaps the, the predators can't control. And I'm just gonna share my screen here and perhaps yeah. you know enough just to go straight into it and sort of see, you know, we, we talk, you spoke about the larger predators eliminating competition. So what do, yeah. what sort of behaviors are exhibited to stop that? And this is just something that came into my mind. Yeah, so um, cheetah, young cheetahs up until they're couple of months old have this beautiful long mane of light fur over their back um, and different hypotheses as to why that might have evolved. Um, one is that it, it blends in nicely with sort of grass, um, considering a lot of animals have don't have color vision and the yellows, the reds, and do sort of the same kind of color. And then there's a great documentary um, called Life in Color, which I believe is on Netflix, and shows different potential ways that creatures see each other. Um, however, a very common hypothesis is that the cheetahs have evolved to mimic a honey badger. So when they're on the same size as a honey badger, they could be mistaken for that. And why that would be useful is the honey badgers are, have a reputation for being some of the most vicious um, potential rivalry uh, sorry, enemies. They're not necessarily going to um, be good hunting um, prey because they fight back. They have extremely strong teeth, claws, and this loose skin. And I've personally um, been very lucky to witness a young group of lions make the mistake of taking on a honey badger. Meanwhile, their parents, the mum, the, the, the lionesses and the male lion have wanted nothing to do with it because they clearly learned as uh, cubs that these were formidable foes. So maybe the cheetah cubs um, will be mistaken for a honey badger from time to time, protecting it from being killed. Thank you very much. And I wonder, does that evoke any further questions? If not, we will wind down. We're almost on the hour. Anyone there? Andreas, thank you so much indeed. And very if anybody wants to let their friends know about this presentation, it will be available on our YouTube channel on share screen in about six or seven days. It takes to be put up there. Um, so thank you everybody indeed. And oh, we have one last question <laughs> um, uh, what, from Evelyn. What is the main reason causing brown hyena and odd wolf numbers to go down? Um, I would, Stay for, yeah, without being able to sort of cite any specific studies on that, uh, as with uh, habitat loss is going to be one of the biggest issues. But then, unfortunately, often lumped in with other predators and are mistaken as um, those that are culprits for the death of livestock. Um, so, poisoning and shooting, spearing, etc., are potential um, reasons for their drop in numbers. But habitat loss, I would argue, is the main cause. 
Great. Well, thank you. And if any of you are interested, tomorrow evening we have our Unlocking Nature series and we will be talking about the canned, well, lions, canned lion hunting um, and the lions in South Africa, the captive predator industry. So please feel free to sign on to that. Thank you once again, Andreas. And thank you, everybody. Have a wonderful day.